Okay, so a um, little bit of a warning. Uh, there's not a whole lot of Python in this. Um, it's a talk that's going to talk about the modern landscape of CMSs, and unfortunately, the modern landscape of CMSs is not too Pythonic. Um, but uh, I will talk about uh, one of the oldest CMSs, which is written in Python that you may not have heard of. Um, so there will be Python in there, um, but I won't be writing a lot of Python code. But there will be a demo. So, uh, so who am I? Um, as mentioned, I, I arrived here in uh, 2014, and I started the Python meetup, I believe the first Python meetup. And we are going to have our 100th uh, meetup on this February, so 2024, which is. Uh, how many people have not been to a Taipei meetup in Bangkok who live here? Have not? Okay, not many, that's cool. So a lot of people come and go, uh, people live in, in different places and stuff, but uh, it's still going strong. Uh, so I did, I did found the PyCon, uh, and we shared it from 2018 and 2019. Code War is, a, is another thing I'm kind of involved with, and we will be doing one in February uh, for, to celebrate the, uh, the 100th. So uh, that's, if we have time at the end, I've got a little video to show you of what a Code War is. Um, actually, I, I dug out some pictures. This is the very first Python meetup in 2014 in Bangkok uh, at a place called Pocket Play Labs. Um, this is uh, me when I had more hair. So this is pre-doing the, um, the chairing a uh, PyCon. Um, so you can see, we'll, we'll see James and Puntip next year and see how their hair level is and see if the same thing happens. Um, so Predigov is uh, the company that I'm a CTO of, and we have mainly deal with government, um, but we're expanding into other sectors. Um, and we've been around a long time. Um, we deal with Australian and UK markets, mostly government within those, um, and some Europe and some NGOs and around the place and so on. Um, so I'm going to start a little bit about design systems. Uh, how many people know what a design system is? Cool. OK. So um, design systems are a kind of uh, a trend in modern uh, web design, I think. Um, so. Design system, the one people might have heard of is material design. Um, the, when you're making mobile apps for Android, for example, um, then you have a set of features, components, look and feel that go along with that that make all the apps look and feel uh, similar. But uh, many different um, companies like uh, yeah, Shopify, have Polaris. This um, uh, website, by the way, is called Component Gallery. It's a very cool way to look at and understand design systems. Um, so these companies also have the same problem that they have lots of different apps and websites, and they want consistency across them. So there are design systems to build applications and, and web um, sites for large organizations. Um, so an example. It, it, Components are a big part of design systems, so a card is a, is a very common component that you will see on modern websites and apps. Um, and this component gallery gives you, you know, so they have 83 different examples from different design systems that have different uh, work in different ways. Um, the other thing about design systems is you can see that um, they've got a few different criteria there. They're, they are talking about, well, does it deal with accessibility? Does it deal with tone of voice? What they mean is, uh, does the design system say how you should address the audience and what kind of language you should use? So a design system is not just a, uh, you know, a, a, um, a visual design. It's a lot more than that. It's saying how, how you should address the audience and, and how they should interact with it. Um, So, uh, yeah, and, and it also sometimes comes with code, sometimes comes with uh, HTML only, sometimes comes with React components and, and a fully working system. Um, so you can see some of the government ones there, like NH, NHS Digital um, and so on. Uh, so that's a very useless technical definition of what a design system is. Um, my way of saying it is it's an implementation independent theme. Um, 
And it is very much about uh, dealing with distributed teams. If you've got a lot of different people doing a lot of different development within large organizations, you need them to communicate in the same way, and uh, it's, it's solving that problem. So it, partly it's about enforcing branding, um, having that consistent user experience, um, and often it, it, it is a way of enforcing, ensuring that the applications are going to be accessibility and wicked compliant. Uh, and obviously, this is very important for government. Governments have a lot of websites. Um, they uh, have lots of departments. And um, Thailand, I don't want to pick on Thailand, but it's like lots of countries have had very bad design on their websites that do very different things um, in, in very strange ways. And having a single w uh, way that, uh, to interact and where you find the same things in the same places is a very nice user experience. Um, so UK, I think, were one of the uh, first people to do this. Um, uh, so what makes a good design system? So I touched on it a little bit. It, it is more than just the design and a few components. It's, it's doing things like saying how to use these things, when you shouldn't use these things, um, what kind of content goes in there. Um, so. One thing I'll talk about here is they, they talk about here with this cards for the New Wales design system um, is, you know, you should have within a, a module or a grid or something, they should all be exactly the same. You shouldn't ever mix them, for example, right? Um, or if they have too many links on them, then there's another component that is better suited to that. Um, and you have app kind of design systems, things like material design. They won't tell you a lot about um, how the content should go and stuff. But when you talk about web design systems, then it is a lot more about content governments and, and how the content should be used or how the components should be used with content. Um, so this whole sort of thing is, is, is coming up because uh, my company, we deal with governments. They implemented, uh, New South Wales government in Australia implemented a design system, and now all the websites have to be built using this design system. So we had to upgrade um, some of our clients to this design system. So this is our journey um, doing that uh, with the, the CMS that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so this has a whole bunch of um, documentation about the design system. It has GitHub repositories with React components and, and so on. It has all this information. You know, I showed you the card one before, but these are all the different components that make up the New Wales design system. And so, uh, yeah, so this is kind of the same point, that when you've got a web design system, you're really uh, addressing both the end users who are creating and, and um, managing the content and adding things to the page, as well as developers. Whereas, say, a material design system, maybe your only audience is developers. Um, so if you look at, uh, in particular, these are examples from the New South Wales design system. Things like cards and grids and sections are things that uh, a user would choose to put up onto the page, right? And you want a, you want a CMS that's going to allow them to express themselves using the design system language and components, but do so in a way that's going to not allow them to create non-compliant designs. Um, and so part of this whole challenge is how do, you, how do you create a UI? How do you create a custom CMS for them that uh, ensures that what they're producing is not going to be against what the recommendations are? Um, so CMS. Uh, CMS, this is, again, my definition. It's, it's basically a UI that uh, enables non-technical people to write content for websites. Um, if you've never come across CMSs before, hopefully most people know what they are. WordPress is the most popular one in the world, um, so you would have heard of that. Um, so this is as opposed to, say, building apps, right? If you're doing Flask or something like that, where you're building a very custom app and content is not a big part of it, you don't need a UI to allow non-technical people to put stuff up. Um, or only in a very sort of structured way. Um, so who are the users of the CMS? Um, so the public, not really. Like the people who are like, actually browsing the website. Um, for convenience here, I'm going to use some, I'm going to use customer experience. That's what the New South Wales government does. They talk about, they have a department of customer experience. Um, and so that is, 
the, the end result, the people who are accessing the end result of the website. So they're not really the people that are using a CMS. Editors, uh, I'm calling it user experience, but um, for the purposes of this talk, um, but in actual fact, I think UX is all relative to who your users are. So um, they're sort of the users of a CMS, but not really, because in reality, what happens is, is this kind of workflow here, right? Where you'll take a base CMS, whether it's WordPress or Drupal or, or, or whatever, and then you will customize it. You will, you will build it uh, on top with a theme and make changes, add plugins, and so on, all creating essentially a custom CMS. This is, this, this is how we do it. Most people don't just plug, you know, just take something out of the box with a CMS and, and away they go. Um, and then the editors come along and then they add all the content and uh, you to make an actual custom website in the end. So really, uh, a good CMS is designed uh, for developers in order to create a, easily create a custom CMS that then they will have no problem presenting to the editors and the editors will go, this is great, I'm having a great time adding the content and you won't get support requests, they won't complain and say this is a load of crap. Um, so things that are important are it should be quick to theme, it should, your developer experience is really about how much do I have to learn, how much work do I have to do to get it to do the things that I'm required to do. And, and this whole talk is, is mainly from the perspective of when you're working with a design system and you're bringing your own HTML and components and so on. So if you are coming in like where you don't have a design in mind, you're just building your own website, that's a completely different CMS experience that I'm not really covering here. Um, so the cheaper you can do that, the quicker you can learn it, the, the, the more profit you make as an integrator or a company like mine. You want it to be easy to maintain, right? Um, you, the ease of use thing kind of comes in again with like less support requests, customers not coming to you and saying, hey, you know, I, I need to achieve this on this page, and you go like, oh, it can't be done, so sorry about that. Um, uh, you, you do want it to run fast and uh, have fast page loads and so on, and compliant to things like uh, WCAG and, and security and so on. So the, the biggest trend, I think, in, in modern CMS is, is headless versus non-headless. Um, so I wanted to kind of go over this a little bit. Um, so there's a lot of different um, people and companies. There's a lot of different um, acronyms going around, like Jamstack and Mac and Mern and, and all this kind of stuff, all saying that this is the best solution. But essentially what headless means, if you're talking about a headless CMS, is that headless means that uh, you have a decoupled, you have the UI over here, and that's your editing UI, then you have uh, a, an API, and then you can bring your own tech. So if you want to do a view, um, like a front end, we're talking front end here, like React, View, Angular, whatever technology you have, I now don't have to learn a whole lot in order to implement uh, the front end part of the equation. Whereas your kind of themable classic CMS, like Drupal, WordPress, you will have to learn how to be a WordPress developer. You will learn how to customize and edit uh, the templates and so on that are all part of that. And um, that's really the, the two developer experiences. One is trying to minimize how much you have to learn and maximize how much you can bring, whether it's your own code or your own experience with building a front end. Um, JavaScript um, front end uh, versus versus the kind of older way, um, but there is a downside. So when you have this decoupled editing experience, uh, you are not going to get a WYSIWYG experience. It's not going to appear exactly like it does on the page. You're going to have forms with uh, fields that you're going to have to map mentally to what it's going to produce on the page. Right? It's um, quite different than what I'm going to explain. Um, so yeah, the, that themable thing is, is, other than learning how to do it, you're also, uh, the deployment model is quite different because you can now, 
deploy, you will often have to combine your code with the CMS's code and deploy the whole lot together. Um, whereas, say, uh, a lot of headless CMS's are SAS, which means that uh, you, that code never changes. It sits there. You sign up to the service. You've got a REST API. You will then deploy the, your front-end code to uh, Netlify, something like that, um, in a different place. And those two things, you know, and, and that, that might cost you a lot less. Or, so it's quite a different deployment model. Um, hybrid CMS is something that you may or may not come across. What it essentially means is that uh, it's a monolith CMS with an API. So you can create your own front end. But the real problem here is that uh, how decoupled is it? How, how much is that UI for editing the content really s designed in such a way that it will work with any front end? Are there assumptions in there about uh, it all being in one code base? Um, so this is, this is my sort of uh, magic quadrant for this particular use case. So when I'm talking about uh, the UX experience, I'm talking about two things. I'm talking about how easy it is for editors to edit, and also the kind of UX uh, enterprise features that large organizations who want a design system may need. Um, and when I'm talking about developer experience, I'm talking about when, again, the sort of headless thing where you are bringing your own HTML and you don't want to have to rewrite it in uh, the CMS. So uh, possibly the most famous Python-based CMS. How many heard of Wagtail? Not that many. This is, this is the world of Python CMS. There's not a lot. There's Django CMS as well. I didn't include that. So WordPress, Drupal, people probably heard of those. Um, so what I'm saying here is that, uh, I mean, this is a bit subjective. I'm saying WordPress with Gutenberg has a nice kind of block space editor. The editing experience is not too bad. It's, it's nice. Uh, but it doesn't, it's not really an enterprise CMS. It doesn't have sort of the workflow and fine-grained permissions and stuff. So it kind of scores worse on that. Drupal scores a bit better um, because it has more of the enterprise stuff, but it is also kind of behind in that block editing experience. Um, and this is kind of where your themable classic CMSs are. And then on the other side, you have headless CMSs, right? So Strapi is, is scores quite well because it, not only is it uh, uh, you know, pretty easy to kind of write the APIs for and so on, it's actually open source, so you can host it yourself. So you get extra points for being flexible there. Um, where these lie, I, story block is quite nice, I think, because it, um, its UI is, is almost, uh, you can kind of click on blocks and things like that. It's quite nice. The difference between sanity and contentful. There's a lot of these different ones. This is a little bit subjective. But the point is, is that your developer experience is going to be nicer because you don't have to learn that much. Um, but at the same time, uh, you're going to score less on your uh, UI. And yeah, all, all three of these are uh, SAS only. So you can't host it yourself. Um, and the one I'm going to be talking about is uh, Plone 6 with Volto. Um, and that was our choice. And the reason is, is that it isn't the most uh, cheapest uh, way to implement a design, but it is the best user experience, I think. So um, that's roughly saying what I've said already, like some of these enterprise features like automations and fine-grained security and, and bulk management and accessibility support and so on. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Plone. Uh, how many people have heard of Plone? I think it was more hands than, uh, than Wagtail, so there you go, okay. But uh, its first release was in 2001. It predates WordPress, it predates uh, WordPress, Drupal. It's actually older than all of those. And uh, funnily enough, uh, Lucas mentioned Zope. It's built on the Zope framework, which is one of the earliest web frameworks out there. Um, again, something you might not have heard of. Um, and as he mentioned, it's not the best way of creating apps, but it is actually quite good uh, for content management. And its, it's sort of database model is, is quite suited towards content management. Um, so I'm just going to, I mean, these are just uh, examples of, of Plone, where it's used today. Um, it's not as popular as Drupal or WordPress, but it's still used in quite a lot, especially in governments. Um, I mean, this is the brand new German uh, um, 
research industry thing that's, that's just been launched using the Volto system that I'm going to talk about. Um, a lot of the Brazilian government runs on it, a huge amount of it. Um, they're quite into it. Um, a lot of, uh, it's probably more European-centric. Um, the EEA in, in Europe um, uses a lot of, a um, little bit in the UK. So, I mean, one thing, it, it's known for its security. Um, it ran both the CIA and the FBI main sites for quite a while. I think it is still used by FBI and not CIA. One of the two, I can't remember which way. Um, it, it has one of the lowest CVE or vulnerability counts of, of any open source CMS. Um, so, the one thing about Plone, I think, is that uh, the Plone you may have heard of is not the Plone that exists today. It, it's a very different beast. Um, and in fact, the latest release, which was this year, really kind of split it into two. I, I'm talking about Plone Headless, which is not an official kind of thing, but so there's three, three ways you can, you can create Plone sites in a way. So Plone Classic is, you know, you have page templates and, and Python, and it's a monolith application and so on. Plone Volto is, is taking the REST API, so your Python system is running at the back with a REST API, uh, and the vast majority of the UI and the themes and everything like that is running in React uh, on, on Express. Um, and what's, what's kind of cool now is that there have been two alternate implementations of that REST API. So you can use Guillotina, which is written in Python, uh, using Postgres, and Nick, which is 100% JavaScript. And they implement the same API, and you can use Volto with that back end. And yes, so then you have a Python-free solution if you, if you really want to. Um, so headless, there are ways of implementing uh, Plone in a headless way. Um, so I think one of the most successful implementations is done in Finland, where they, they use Gatsby and a Volto editing UI. Um, but it's not supported as well as it could. Like what it's doing is, is using the base sort of Volto components and, and uh, allowing you to edit them, and then it will roll out and um, push that out using uh, Gatsby and GraphQL. Um, so the structured block editing uh, interface is kind of very um, Notion or Medium-like, um, I'll show you in a sec, is, is really nice. It's a really nice editing experience. Uh, and you see exactly what you're going to get on the page. It is you're editing directly into the page like you are with Medium and so on. Uh, all CMSs are designed to be extended. Um, it has those extra enterprise features. The security record accessibility is multilingual out of the box. And this new modern stack is kind of a future-proofing thing, right? Like if you need to do integrations and so on, uh, add microservices, all of that can be done with this sort of... Uh, uh, front-end architecture. Um, so the actual database that the Plone backend runs is something called ZeroDB, which is another interesting technology, which um, I should probably talk about at TyPy sometime. It's an object database, um, and it, it actually is pretty cool. It's a nice, easy way of getting persistence um, in, a, in a sort of scalable way where you're just dealing with objects. It's not an object or relational mapper. It is literally objects. Um, so how does this architecture work? So what happens is that uh, the browser will first make a request to uh, the SSR kind of server, right? So it will then help with SEO and stuff. So you, uh, the first request will be getting back an HTML page. And that will essentially do what the browser will do later. It will make REST API calls to the Plone service, um, which will then talk to the database. Modern ZODB will run on top of Postgres and so on, so you don't lose Postgres. We run it that way. Um, and then after that, right, the browser, when you click next page or do something, is, is then just doing API calls right, and refreshing the page that way. It's no longer going and getting the whole HTML and so on. So that it, it becomes a lot more interactive, a lot faster. Um, after that first call. Um, sorry, I didn't explain it. SSR means server-side rendering. So it's, it's rendering the HTML the same as it would in a browser and then sending that back. Um, so 
uh, this is not that important, but this is looking at the different ways of uh, building Plone and what the, the pros and cons are, right? So I think the, the build cost was more with Volto than it was in the old way in some way, um, but the page size is, um, is better. I'll just skip that. Okay, so here's how you can install this and, and use this. So uh, I'll, I'll do this in a sec. But uh, essentially, that back-end plone part, I'm just going to use Docker and, and run it in Docker. Uh, then you install sort of a, a scaffolding system that will create a bunch of uh, files for you that will then give you a Volto environment that you can then customize um, and start it up. So let's try that. OK, so let's run Docker. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just a clone six image, and I've already created that um, scaffolding and so on, so I won't go through that. There's a whole bunch of building it compiles, brings a whole lot of things, and that's still going to do that. OK, so. Almost there. OK. Right, OK. OK. It's running in debug mode, so it you know, does slow reloading. It doesn't run like that in production. So you can see it's got a pretty minimal interface. Um, which is nice. So if I want to just edit the page, I can edit the page. Um, if I want to, you know, add some text below, I can uh, title. I can make that a heading and so on. Um, it has a whole kind of world of blocks. So things like um, a listing block, which is an automated listing of things. We've got. Um, this is a hero block um, at the front. Um, and in particular, what I'm going to do is show an example of uh, the card, which I talked about before. So the sort of out of the box way of um, creating a card in Volto, let's, let's kind of go through that. Um, so I would say create a grid. Um, and I'm going to add my teaser. So they call cards teasers. Um, and that is going to, so I can pick my Apple page, I can add a, another teaser, and pick my orange page. Okay. So, pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, and this, this is an automated listing. So if I go and create a new page, uh, page. So if I do a Pamelo page, uh, okay. So you can see, actually, the um, let's make that listing a little bit more interesting. We want to make it a summary. So it should, okay, displays the. So you can see all the changes I'm making will instantly get reflected on the page, and it's and it's as it appears when you log out. Uh, so we have our new Salesforce design system. We have this great editing experience. How do we take marry the two things together? Um, so. Uh, so when we create that um, the scaffolding, we get a whole big um, folder structure that has lots of places that you can customize and, and extend and add components and so on. Uh, mostly in the source thing here, we have um, yeah, different things. Um, 
I'm not going to have time to kind of go in of, of how you do it, and it's React anyway, and this is a Python conference. So, um, but I think this is sort of a, a hierarchy of here's what you're going to do the most, right? Um, actually, I didn't I didn't show that. There's there's a whole bunch of things you can do within the Plone UI as well, right? So, um, if I want to create a new content type, that's as easy as just going here and creating a new one. Um, if I want to do things like uh, edit what the schema is for a page and add a new field that everyone has to fill out and make it compulsory, then I can do that, right? So I can say new field, which is, I don't know, uh, review date or something, and make it required, right? So now everyone who creates a page has to actually fill this out before they can, they can do a page. Um, it has a flexible workflow system built in. You can create layouts for these pages that are compulsory. It has uh, lots of different things. Things like um, content rules, which are automation. So every time something gets published or changes workflow, then you can send an email and, and do stuff like that. Um, a lot of features that have been thought about for over a long, long period of time. The fine-grained permissions model with groups inside groups and, and sharing and allowing um, so, this, so let's say this this page here. I want to. I want to say okay. So um, you know, I can set a set of group as being the reviewers for this page, and that's different in one part of the site than another part, and so on. Okay. So, right. Two minutes. Okay. I am um, way behind. Okay. So mostly, what you're going to be doing is React stuff. Uh, the Python. You can create new uh, API endpoints and do Python. That's reasonably straightforward. But in most of the development, you don't need to do that. Um, so uh, let's just very quickly show you. OK. So if I shut this down, I am going to kill that. And I'm going to start a new backend with some extra plugins. Uh, somewhere in here. There we go. So I'm just adding a few, few uh, more plugins, and then I will go. Um, so this is just a check out of our design system. So it's it's got a whole bunch of extra front end code. So while that's starting up. Um, so this is, this is a little bit more about the design system. You have, uh, it comes with React components. They have lots of different options. So there's, there's actually very, a lot of different ways these cards can appear within the new surveillance design system. Um, and they can appear in automated listings um, as well as those sort of manual listings like the grids I can show. And this is the steps you would do to you, you know, start our design system as is at the moment. So if I go here, okay, and do refresh, let's see if, ah, no, this is JavaScript development for you. Why does it have to build everything? Okay. Let me just quickly see if there's anything important in the rest of the slides, which there's not enough time for. Yeah, yeah. I think that's it. OK. Is it working? OK. Let me just refresh that. OK, and now it looks like the design system. And if I want to go and add sort of our version of that card grid. So it looks a little bit different. But some of the things we did is that, like, well, all these things have to be exactly the same. So um, uh, orange. And if we change here, we can um, the grid type, color position, so we can make it, you know, all above, 
hide the images and make them more, uh, white or dark, et cetera, et cetera. And it changes all of them at once. You don't have to go and add each one and change each one and so on. Um, so, uh, okay. Any quick questions? Do I have any time? That's sure. it. Sure. Maybe just one question. Okay. One quick question. Nope. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much.